dun 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 What is this This music? is my music. I wish I had brought, like, I should have just gotten music. That would have been smarter, you wouldn't it? Bored. <laughs> I could have gotten an MP3. I wanted the Indiana Jones music. Dun 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 dun. Because I always feel like a little tiny version of Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. Your tempo was a little off. Shut up, Haley. (laughs) Children, don't say shut up. That's not polite. But when you're in the grown-up world, sometimes you have to. So anyway, you're listening to the Repcolite Home Improvement Show. All the music is because it's the 300th episode. The big deal. Yes. It's a big deal to me. It's a big deal to Haley. Yeah. It's a big deal by necessity of for my children. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And we've got a lot of fun things that we're going to do today. Uh, We're going to give away. Uh, some paint. paint packages. We had some a contest that we ran last week. We'll have the winners for that. And if you missed that contest and you're thinking, oh, shucks, what's going to happen for me today? Well, we've got an extra contest that we're going to run at the end of the show, and we're going to have three more winners. Yep. All right. So before we get to episode 300 and all of the amazing things we want to cover, we do have to make some corrections, Yeah. which is fine. Last week we talked about... Inflation chickens, not inflated chickens or inflatable chickens. <laughs> chickens inflation you might buy chickens to hedge off inflation and right. the cost of eggs, and so we talked about all of the the costs that you could endure if you decided to purchase chickens. Right, all the things that go along with raising them, how long they're good for, and we made a lot of fun of that. But we were making fun of the idea of buying the chickens to save, to money. Sa- yeah, to stave off inflation. Right. That's where it gets a little funny. We did get, um, we asked for feedback because we knew we probably were missing some things here, you know. And we got feedback from Patrick, who raises some chickens kind of as a hobby. Right, a little hobby farm. And he wanted to make a couple corrections. And he's got six chickens. He's been raising them for about 10 years. And he says, first off, cold weather doesn't really affect the laying of eggs unless it's 10 degrees right. or below. So it's got to be pretty extreme. Right. So there we go with that one. They need about 10 hours of light, but not necessarily sunshine. So put a light in the coop, set it on a timer, and you're good to go. Also, he wanted to point out that it takes about four to five, four and a half to five months before the the, the hens start laying eggs. Not six so months like we said. Six, yep. And also, the breeds of today will lay for a good three years and beyond. So anyway, he's a hobby chicken raiser, and he said, as a hobby, there's expense involved. He expects that. Yeah. And so. And I love the idea of having chickens as a hobby. I think, yeah, our our bigger point was this not a way to save money. Do it because you love raising chickens. Yeah. yeah. and But we wanted to make sure we got all of the clarifications out there from a yeah. real chicken raiser. Yes. So, Patrick, thanks for emailing a us. real chicken raiser. And getting us that <laughs> info. Right. I was a real chicken raiser, but I was too little to and really afraid know. to really remember what happened. Sure. So no good information <laughs> for me. That's why we have listeners. All right. On the show, we've got a lot of things. We're going to give away paint at the end Mm -hmm. and free stuff. We're also going to be talking about faking things with paint. That's going to be fun. Right, adding character, things like that. Extension cords, laser levels, all kinds of stuff coming up. Right now, though, we've got not tons of time, maybe four-ish minutes or so. And I want to just talk about 300 episodes. And Haley, you've been here for about 100 of them. Right. What has been your favorite part? Not the favorite thing we've covered. I want to know your favorite part of doing radio because radio is really unique. I have like three favorite parts. Okay. You're going to have to be really fast. quick. One, I love researching the topics. Okay. I'm a very curious person. I like to know how things work. And so it's really rewarding to have all this information and to be able to apply it to my life and like feel empowered to maybe tackle more things than I could have otherwise because I wouldn't have spent the time getting to know all of these different, you know, DIY projects sure. the way that I have for the show. Your job requires you yes. to learn things. It's really <laughs> nice really when like that, that happens. That. Yeah. And we get to share the information. I think that's if I could have gone in a different direction career-wise, it probably would have been teaching. I come from a long line of teachers. Mm-hmm. I find it really rewarding to be able to you know, understand some information and be able to empower other people with that information. All right. I think, you know, we'd have a really cool job in that way. We really get to affect, hopefully, some people's lives and projects that they feel comfortable tackling. Sure. I like that. So that's two. You said you had another one? The art of conversation, Dan. You know, I think it's lacking these days. (laughs) We don't get to spend as much time face-to-face. We're distracted. We, you and I, 
I would call you a friend. We have set aside time every week where we just get to have a conversation, a real conversation, not about, you know, small talk or like daily events in our lives, but like a conversation about a topic. And I don't know that everyone gets to spend that time. No, I agree. I didn't listen to everything you said, but (laughs) it makes some sense. You know, the parts I heard. No, I I like that. I like how you said you would consider me a friend and then you you pause for a second and people can't see your eyes. But you were (laughs) you were weighing that in your head. Is that really where I want to go? I'm not sure. But yes, I love the idea of sitting down and talking about stuff. Some of my favorite segments are the ones where we don't plan anything out. Yeah. You know, we've got an extension cord one coming up where we planned everything out. There's yeah, a lot of details. Detail. And it's it was a struggle to get through and right. get the whole thing recorded because there were so many details. Yeah. I like when we can just shoot from the hip and have a conversation. And like you said, really fun to do that. Um, I've got a lot of fun things. Let's see here. I don't have tons of time and that's okay. I like working with, um, all these people that we get to interview. Yeah. That's been really fun to me to meet new people, to learn from them. Right. You know, the things that they know that they've seen. Yeah. We get to interview experts. It's really, it's really fun. And beyond experts, you know, everybody's got a great story to tell. Right. Even if you don't realize it, even if you think your, your life is really boring or what you do is boring. There's somebody out there somewhere who's going to find it cool. And I'm <laughs> one of those people. TV is proof of that. <laughs> I love listening to these stories. Yeah. I love working with the creative people that I get to work with. You know, Betsy was very creative. Yeah. You're very creative. You push me in directions. And I just love that. I love having people that every day like I get to come challenged back. challenged by me. That's nice. I do like that. But I just like, like you said, the friendship and be able, yeah. being able to talk about things and no, kick things around. Cool. And I love the listeners. I love people who will reach back out like right. Patrick did in the beginning. Give us information. Help us make a better show moving forward. Absolutely. So without the listeners out there, all of this would be pretty pretty moot. There's no reason to be talking (laughs) if nobody's listening. So thank you to everybody who's listening. Hopefully 300 more episodes coming right up. All right. That's all the time we've got for this. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, we're talking about extension cords. And from then on, it's radio history, right? Right. All of that's coming up next. Stick around. Well, Haley, we have established multiple times on multiple episodes in all of our 300 episodes. (laughs) We have probably addressed it 300 times that I'm cheap. Yeah, Yeah. it seems to play into a lot of conversations, surprisingly. Absolutely. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And once again, I'm going to make the confession I'm cheap, and it plays out into every aspect of my life. (laughs) Let's talk about how it played out played out. This is past tense yes, now. Past. That's important. Yeah. With extension cords. When I, years back, would buy an extension cord, and I always needed to buy a lot of them because yeah, I would cut them up. problem with extension Yeah, cords. I would cut them up on the yard with the hedge trimmer. Not on purpose. <laughs> no, not on purpose. <laughs> not at all. No, I, it's not that I like the sparking and all of that. I <laughs> preferred to not experience that, but I would still do it none, nonetheless. Yeah. And so I needed to buy new ones. And because I was cutting them up, maybe that played into it, I would always go and find, try to find the cheapest, longest cord I could. Yeah. That combination figured to me in my brain to be just the, the absolute golden way forward. I, that just seems practical to me, though. I think I've always done the same thing. I've always gotten the longest extension cord that I could get for the money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't think it's that strange. I think right. it's a big mistake that I've made. It's a big mistake you made. Yeah. And I think it's a really common mistake. And I didn't know it was a mistake until you told me about this segment that we're about to do because yes. you've done it before. I And we're going to talk about all of that. It turns out that one size doesn't fit all with right. extension cords. They vary for a reason. Your appliances and the tools that you run with them have different power requirements. And if you use the wrong extension cord, it can right. impact the tool performance. It can damage the tool over time. You can even start fires, In right? some instances, that's a possibility. And we're going to e- explain yeah. all of that coming up. But let's talk right now about the things that you need to know. Some basics to wrap your brain around so that you get the right extension cord. Right. Now, when choosing an extension cord, the very first thing you need to consider is the amps that are required by your equipment. Right, because things like lamps and things like circular saws are going to take different amps of power, right? right. The circular saw is going to need more amps than your lamp will. Right. Now, amps basically, just to take a step back, in basic terms, it's the rate of flow of electric current. 
That's how we measure that. We measure that in amps. And as Haley said, bigger tools are going to require more of them. Smaller right. tools will require less. Just to give you a rough idea, a small oscillating tool like a Dremel, sure, you know, one of those little tools, that will function at about two to four amps. An electric drill is going to function at six to ten amps, depending. Right. A circular saw, now we're starting to get up there, or a yep. bench saw or something like that, that can run and require about 13 to 15 amps and so on. So the first step in the whole process is to look at the different tools that you plan to be running and kind of get a gauge for Which makes sense, what it requires. But somehow that never factored into my thought process. <laughs> no, it never did me either. And I'll explain an example later on that will kind of make the case. And maybe other people have experienced this. But the first thing, figure out yeah. how many amps are required. The next thing you need to consider is how much electrical load your extension cord will handle or the extension cord that you're thinking about buying. Exactly. And that's largely determined by the length of the cord and its gauge. But I think we'll start with the length, right? Because you always got the longest extension cord you could find. Right. And it seemed like it made a ton of sense, right. but there's a problem with that, and it's called resistance. See, all wires have some degree of resistance, and as the electrical current flows through, it dissipates as it travels the length of the wire. Sure. Now, that dissipated energy is expelled in the form of heat, and this lost energy means that less power, of course, mm -hmm. is reaching your equipment. It's called voltage drop. Right. So it starts off really strong. Strong, and then by the end of the cord, especially when it's long, right. you've dropped quite a bit of power. Right. It's negligible over short distances. Right. So 25-foot cord, you're probably not going to see anything. But with the Mongo cords that I would buy, yes. <laughs> you know, you really would run into those problems. And that's what I, you know, my particular situation that really brought this all to a head and made me aware of it was a project on the yard I was working on. And the closest working outlet was about 80 feet sure. away. So I had my huge, because, oh yeah, yeah you've oh got man. Super long extension cords. I could do three times that distance, <laughs> but I didn't need to. I was equipped and ready. So I got my 100 foot extension cord yeah. out and ran it all the way out to where I was working and put my little bench saw down. Sure. And I noticed that as I would cut through wood, you know, the very first thinnest pieces that I was cutting, no problem. Like, yeah. But then I got to something that was more like, you know. Like plywood or something. Right. A, yeah. Well, it was just a quarter of an inch thick. And now the blade was starting to bog mm -hmm. down. I assumed that I must have purchased the cheapest, <laughs> most well, garbage bench saw possible. I mean, you're possible. probably not wrong. <laughs> no, it was, it was. It was very cheap and inexpensive. And I assumed that it was the right. saw's problem. Yeah. So I packed everything up after a while because it was way too frustrating. I yeah. couldn't get the project done. It just wouldn't keep no. cutting. I've had this exact same situation. I was cutting with a circular saw. Same thing. Had a 100-foot extension cord. Didn't even need it to be that long. I was working right next to the outlet. Oh, that's really <laughs> dumb. That's even dumber. Yes. And, yeah, every time I'd get, like, maybe halfway through and it would start to bog down to the point where it's like, okay, this feels dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I just gave up. Yeah. See, I moved into the garage. I packed everything up. I was going to quit, but something in my head said, just try it one more time. So I plugged the bench saw directly into the outlet, no yeah. extension cord at all. And it was brilliant. It worked just fine. And that's when I realized there's something else going on. Extension it's cord. the length of the cord and the voltage drop that's happening. Yeah. All right. That's one part of the problem. You can counter voltage drop by increasing the thickness or the gauge of the wire, which is right. the other thing Haley started right. by talking about. The thicker the wire, the less resistance it offers, allowing the cord to deliver full power right. all the way to the tool over a longer distance. So gauge is marked on the packaging usually, and it's usually going to be on the cord itself, and it's usually, a lot <laughs> of usually is there, yeah. represented in numbers, in, in a fraction. Yes, it's thicker. Yes. You know, that's, that's yes. one tip off right <laughs> off the bat. That one's a really good one, but it also will have numbers stamped on it, like a little fraction, sure. like 14 over 3 or 12 over 3. They're not great fractions. We would tend to want to break them down, right? And do the yeah. math. That, yeah, but don't that do the math. Strange. Just look at the 14 over 3. And what it means is it's 14 gauge with three conductor wires. Or it's 12 gauge with three conductor wires. Okay. Now with gauge, it's kind of like golf. You've got to understand that the greater the number, the bigger the number, golf. <laughs> the thinner the gauge. So the smaller the number, the thicker the gauge. It's kind of an opposite thing. Yeah. Like the, the lower golf score is better. Happy. Right. So you, okay, th that didn't help Haley. <laughs> the bigger concept, just remember, smaller number means thicker gauge. Yeah. So Got bottom it. line here, shorter, thicker gauge cords can deliver more power. Long, thinner gauge cords are easy to handle, but they deliver much less power. Right. So with all of that said, how in the world do you pick 
which court is right for your situation. Well, really, it all depends on the factors that we were just talking about. Right. The amps required by the equipment and the distance you need to run the cord. So there are some generic recommendations that we can run through. Right. Now, first, right off the bat, really no brainer here, own several different cords. Don't buy one and use it for everything. It's not convenient. It's not efficient. And it really could be dangerous. A cord that's too long will often result in an undesirable level of voltage drop in the tool, right? We talked about that over time and how that energy is dissipated in the form of heat. Now, this can damage the cord. It can damage your tool, but it also can cause potentially a fire. And the the way that that occurs is that if we've got a 100-foot cord and we're doing a project like Haley mentioned right. you were doing where you're six feet away. Exactly. So it's all coiled up. It's you don't want a cord. <laughs> Most people aren't going to uncoil that whole cord. Yeah. So the cord stays coiled up. Well, if you're using a cord that is not set or gauged for the amount of amps required by your specific tool, it right. can overheat. Right. And it can actually overheat to the point where it will melt the insulation and could start a fire. Now, if you're using a great big heavy gauge cord mm-hmm. and you're running something that it can handle and that it can deliver the load to, it's not going to overheat. You don't have to worry about that. It's only when you're using the thinner gauge stuff to run something pretty big that this fire, potential fire hazard. Which is exactly what I was doing, right? Right. And if you did that for long periods of time, you could potentially start a fire. It's not terribly common, but it is common enough to mention because we want to be safe. We don't want to just make crazy recommendations (laughs) that cause all kinds of damage. So anyway, that's where that fire thing played out. That's using a cord that's too long and too narrow. So don't buy one cord for everything. That's the big bottom line there. Get a bunch of different cords. So you have a 25-foot cord, a 50-foot cord, a 100-foot cord. And that way you've got, you know, if I was just working with that 25-footer in my garage next to the outlet, that would have made a lot more sense. Right. I have some different sizes. (laughs) Secondly, buy bigger gauge cords as you're able to. Yes, they're more expensive, but they do work better for almost every project. Now, here are a couple guidelines. We'll put these in the show notes, but this will really sum it up, and it kind of puts a nice bow on everything. So if you've got a 25-foot, 14-gauge cord. Sure, so all right, a thicker one. Thick, a little bit thicker. 16 is typically what we see. You know, when I'm buying the cheap stuff, I'm yeah. buying 16-gauge cords. So 14-gauge, a little thicker cord, 25-foot. That is usually going to deliver up to 15 amps, so it's going to run drills, reciprocating saws, miter saws, circular saws, even smaller table saws, little bench saws. So over that lot. Over that 20 25 foot, no problem. Now, if you need to power those same types of tools, but over 50 feet, well, then you need to bump up to a 12 gauge cord. A 50 foot, 12 gauge cord will power most of the tools in a typical home. Now, if you're looking to do that same kind of thing, those same kinds of tools, work with those over 100 feet, like what I was doing, then 10 gauge is your best bet. Now, I'm going to be dropping some money to do that, but I'm going to be able to power all of the tools that I need to power over the course of that 100 feet if I've got a 10 gauge cord. Well, and it's worth the money at that point then because you know that you're not going to damage the tool that you're running. You're not going to start a fire. You've got all the requirements in that cord. Right. So anyway, we're going to put all of that info in the show notes so you can check it out if you want to go back and scan that one more time. Extension cords. There's just so many different things. More to know than you would think. It's kind of scary how little we sometimes know about Seriously, even the yeah. most basic things. <laughs> like, for instance, way off topic, but what makes your blinker make that clicky sound? <laughs> right? What in the one world? Of the, one of the kids asked me that. When you have kids, Haley, you're yeah. going to find out how little you know because yeah. kids will clue into things that we take for granted. Yeah. They will ask you about that. The best question. And you have no idea. Yeah. Why is it making you're a like clicky sound? An idiot. I have no idea. <laughs> so when your kids ask you about extension cords, though, yeah, now you've got some answers. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a break. The Detroit listeners, you're going to get a Repco Light Rewind. Really good stuff planned for you. Grand Rapids, you're going to get news and weather at the bottom of the hour. Maybe it's yeah. really good news and maybe it's really great weather. So maybe right. it's really good for you, too. Anyway, once that's all over, we'll all meet up later and we're going to be talking about faking it with paint. Yes. And I'm not going to say any more about it. Nope. To figure it out, you're going to have to keep listening. That's next. Stick around. You're listening to the Repcolite Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore on 106.7 Detroit's Wheels. And right now it's time for another Repcolite Rewind, where we check out great segments from past episodes. This time, we're rewinding our way back to July 10 of 2021. Well, Haley, when I think about everything that we just talked about with Lauren, and then I think about my kitchen... Because yeah. I like to make these things extremely personal. Right. Because that's it's how I solve, <laughs> I solve my problems on work time. And that's smart. But anyway, when I think about my kitchen, 
I'd love to incorporate a lot of the things that she mentioned and talked about, but it's just, it's not a realistic situation right now. My kitchen, just to quickly explain it, it's the 80s oak it's or the, the 90s oak, oak or whatever it is. I don't know yeah. what time period. Yeah, 80s, 90s. Yeah, it's got yeah. that honey kind of a, uh-huh. a feel to it. And there is a ton of it, a ton of oak. It, the ceiling actually is even wood, a lot of wood in that kitchen. Yeah, and for me to pull those cabinets out, which would be the ideal, and to right. reconfigure things, it's just not something I can get into right now. I just can't swing it. I don't have the time, all of that. And so for anybody in my situation, you know, yes, there's a dream list of things that we'd love to tackle. And if you're in the process of scoping out your future kitchen, pay attention to things Lauren's talking about because you want to make sure you cover those. Right. If you're not in that boat, you're not completely out of luck. No, there are still things that you can do, right? There are small paint projects that can make a big difference. Well, and some of them are big paint projects, Well, right? If we yeah. really want to be, <laughs> Haley's trying to, you know, uh, make the sale there. And it is. Some of them are small. Some small. Yeah, maybe you don't have a lot of cabinets. Right. <laughs> yeah. But even if you do have a full kitchen that you're thinking about repainting, uh, the cabinets there, you know, and we all know people who have done that and we're all jealous of those people. Right? Hopefully. Unless they really did a yeah, terrible job. Yeah, unless they did a horrible job. Maybe we're not jealous then. Most of the time we're a little jealous because we see what they've done. We know they gutted through what we perceive is a terrible project. Mm-hmm. And they've hit the other side and it looks so different. And that's the beauty. And let's just start with that. That's the beauty of a paint project in the kitchen. If you're tackling your cabinets, the remarkable turnaround yes. that you'll experience. It's it's a completely different kitchen when it's done well. Right. I mean, that's the amazing thing that color can do is it completely transforms the space. And cabinets is not out of the realm of anyone's skill set. We can walk you through these projects and we'll get into some of the key considerations right now. But this is definitely a project to consider if you're not in a position to do a full kitchen rehaul. Even just hardware can make a big difference. Hardware. And the other thing I want to say before we get to those key considerations is that even if you're sitting on a situation like mine with oak, you know, a lot of us hear rumblings that you can't paint the oak because it's not going to look good. You're going to still see all that open grain. Sure. Right. It's not like a birch door that's going to be smooth and look great painted. The oak's going to show all that grain and all of that. And yes, that's true. You're going to see some of that. Now, what's interesting is it's actually trending to see some of that graining right? yeah. in the oak. So you'd actually be on trend. More importantly, if you get it painted and you put new hardware on, chances are you're not going to see that graining when you just look at your kitchen. No. When you and really I still examine think it. It looks good. Yeah. Well, Think about it. When you look at your kitchen right now, if you look at those doors, mm-hmm. you see all this graining because there's a dramatic difference in color between yes. the closed grain and the open grain. The open grain's much darker. It gives you the, you know, just the, the contrast. When that's all one color, now the only thing you're seeing is the texture that shows through and it's dramatically minimized. So you can have great results even if you've got oak cabinets, but you do want to focus on a couple of key considerations to make sure the project goes smoothly. Right. And the first considerations are going to be the right products, the right tools. But first with products, primer. (laughs) We all have the idea that we don't need primer necessarily, that it's just this extra thing. But really, it makes a huge difference, especially with cabinets. Right. You've got one shot at doing this. And and that's going to play out into a lot of the things that we're going to talk about here. One shot at doing it the first time. And if you skimp it, Mm -hmm. skimp by and try to make something work, it can work. If it doesn't work, the fix is way complicated because how do you get that finished paint off and get down to a sound surface again? Well, I've got a friend that lives in a rental and they started cleaning the cabinets when they first moved in and the paint just started peeling off in sheets. So they had clearly not prepped or, you know, primed the cabinets. They didn't put the paint on? The paint was already there? They didn't do the paint. They're just cleaning it and the paint's coming off. Yep. So it, that's the first sign that something's not right there. Yeah, that prep shouldn't was happen. not done. <laughs> and then what do you do? How do you get all of that paint off? Because you can get the parts that peel mm-hmm. off. You put new paint on, and the parts that didn't peel off earlier then can start. Blah blah blah. Nobody wants to be in that boat. No. Do the prep work and use the right products right from the get go. Like Haley's mentioning, the primers. We could go into them, and we have on the show. We've talked about all the different primers that are out there. But really, right now, we just want to say almost every kitchen can be somewhat different and unique. And the the cool thing is, no matter what you've got going, 
there's a set of products that will work to get you where you want to be. Exactly. So bring in a door, you know, pull a door off, bring it into the store. Let us look at what you're working with and we'll direct you to the right products. But we've got regular primers. We've got bonding primers like yeah, sticks. You've got a super shiny cabinet finish and you need paint to bond to that. You have to go with a bonding primer and sticks is the perfect option. It sticks. Yeah. yeah. And we've talked about it in so many situations. Sticks is great for so many projects. Just be aware there's this bonding primer out there called Sticks. And if you're worried about what you're painting, mm-hmm. you might want to ask about it. And you know that might help you solve your problem. It can work really well for kitchens and cabinets and stuff like that. Another primer that sometimes becomes required right. in a job like this is Bin Primer. It's a white pigmented shellac. And its main claim to fame is it will cover and seal stains in, like water stains or smoke stains or tannin bleed through. Yes, that would be the kitchen cabinet situation where you have this wood that's actually going to release some of those tannins and bleed through the paint potentially. So you've got to seal that in and bin is a great option for that. Right. And we can walk you through that in the store when you come in and just talk about the project. Primers, moving on from there, finish paint. Using the right finish paint can make a huge difference, not just on how well it holds up in the future, but even how smoothly the project goes. Yeah, this is a completely smooth surface, typically, so you're going to see every brush stroke if you don't use the right paint. Advance, for example, levels out really well. It's so easy to work with. It's an oil-water hybrid, essentially, is how you can think of it. It's got all the great features of an oil-based product, where it levels out really nicely. It's going to be a really hard finish for your cabinets, but it's still water cleanup and low VOC. Right. It sounds a little scary. Whenever you tell people it's a modified Alkyd. You yes. know, it's got the benefits of an oil, soap and water cleanup like a latex. It seems a little strange. It's so simple to work with. I've had people who are brand new painters mm-hmm. who came back and said it was the easiest paint they've ever worked with. I love it. It flows out so well, self levels beautifully. That's advanced from Benjamin Moore. There's also Scuff X. We talk about it all the time. We're seeing that used more and more on cabinets and trim. That's another option. Repcolite makes Optima. And that is a super high end. It's the best thing we produce. And in fact, we talked about it, what, four weeks ago or so on the show? Yeah, probably a month ago. The president of the company, Dan Altina, came on and said it's the best thing almost anybody anywhere can produce, right? (laughs) Yeah. We're using the top of the line ingredients to make it. It's going to hold up remarkably well. That's Optima. Check it out in the stores. Ask about it. The big thing here. Use the right products. Don't skimp on this step. Right. Especially because these cabinets take a beating. I mean, we've got sticky hands on them. They're opening and closing on a regular basis. So use the right product. But then use the right tool when you're applying the product, because that's really the other half of this project is the applicator that you're using. If you're using you know, a really cheap brush or a cheap roller that you're going to get all this shed from onto the finished surface, I mean, all of your money spent on product is just out the door now. You've got to redo it. Right. People don't think about that. I don't think about that. You know, but when you say it the way you said it, you can buy the best paint that money can buy. Mm -hmm. And it's going to look as good as the applicator you use to put it on with. Exactly. So you can save and we've all done it. Right. I've done it in maybe not in paint, probably in paint, but for sure in other aspects where I've cheaped out on something and it's affected Definitely. The thing that I spent the money on just to save a couple bucks. It's not worth it. Use no. good tools. You'll not only get a better look, you'll have a better experience putting it on. Oh, absolutely. It completely changes your experience as the painter. So you've got all of those things, the right tools, the right paint, the right products. You've got to make sure you do the right prep work. We don't have time to go into it now, but there are a set of steps that you need to do. And we're hearkening back to that thing we said at the beginning. If you do the foundational work and you do it poorly... You know, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. (laughs) It's leaning because the foundation wasn't set correctly. That's why it's leaning. Now, that one turns out to be kind of cool. Yeah, now it's his claim to fame. Yeah, but you don't want that kind of thing in your kitchen. If the foundation is bad, it's really tough to fix it. So just make sure you do the right work. Now, we'll walk you through everything you need to know about this. If you just stop out at the store, you can chat with us online at repcolite.com. You can email Haley and I, radio at repcolite.com. We'd love to help you. Get into a project that will really change the look and feel of your home. 
And that'll do it for another Repcolite Rewind. Remember, you can check out full episodes from our archives by heading to repcolite.com. That's R-E-P-C-O-L-I-T-E dot com and clicking the On the Radio tab on the homepage. And if you do want to check out the conversation that we referenced in the beginning of this particular Repcolite Rewind segment, then you can download episode number 220 and check it out there. All right, it's time for a break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about faking it with paint. And what does that even mean? You're going to have to stick around to find out. That's all just ahead, so stay right there. And we're back, and Haley, we ended last segment talking about turn signals, blinkers, and stuff like that. Yes. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, and one of the things that I love to do is to make sure I have been complete in what I've talked about. I will say things 12 different times just to make sure I've said it enough right you know that Haley yes you like to repeat things that have just been said over different ways <laughs> slightly but meaning the same thing <laughs> yeah I, I don't know why but I've done that since the very beginning of the show I was listening to very old segments yeah you know episode 20 episode 4 I'm doing exactly what I do now so it's not something I've grown into it's something I've always done it's, an, it's good that you've never grown out of it yeah it's an incompetency <laughs> that it's just part of it anyway this is not exactly that But I talked about turn signals and I made just a statement that where does the sound come from? Yeah. You know, the kids asked me and I didn't know the answer for it. And so we made a joke about it. Right. (laughs) And then we ended the segment. Anyway, I started thinking about it in the break. The Internet is at my fingertips. Mm -hmm. I do not have to not have the answers to these things. (laughs) So for all of you out there right now whose lives are incomplete because you do not know why this is happening and why that sound is happening in your car, I've got the answer. Here's very quickly what's going on, and then we'll get into faking it with paint. So the turn signal first appeared in automobiles in 1909. Oh, wow. Way, way a long time ago. They wanted wanted people to know where they were going way back then already. It's not a new concept. But the click Mm -hmm. that we know didn't happen until the 30s. Inventor okay. Joseph Bell came up with this little device sure. that would send electricity to the outer turn signals. Okay. And that device happened to click okay, because of so how it was working. On purpose necessary? No, not on purpose at all. It was just a, a lucky accident. Right? Buick was the first automaker to add the new technology to the cars in 1939. and it didn't make a sound? No. That, yes. At that point, they all made sounds from that point on. Okay. And so they continue to make sounds. And but that's where it comes from. They don't need to necessarily. They don't necessarily. Well, I think it does need to because of how the little device works. So we haven't updated that? Well, the device has changed a little bit, but there's still this bimetallic spring huh. that when the circuit is completed, it okay. naturally yeah. makes right. this little clicky sound. I'm Got sure it. they could get away from it if they wanted to. But now we're so used to it. It's so pleasant. Everybody yeah. goes, blinker, blinker, uh-huh. blinker, right? When yeah. it's turning. Do you sing that little song? No, nope, I don't. But okay. I don't. Well, now everybody will. It's ear candy. It's a little earworm that's gotten into your heads. Blinker, blinker, blinker. I like to use hazards when I turn signals so nobody knows exactly where I'm going. Right. I like to keep people guessing. Anyway. Now I have completed (laughs) that thought on turn signals. Let's transition abruptly. Yes, very abruptly. (laughs) I'm signaling the turn. (laughs) We are going into talking about faking it with paint. What in the world are we talking about, Haley? Yeah, well, it's been a big trend lately in interior design, especially, you know, on DIY platforms like Pinterest or Instagram. We see a lot of people trying to add character into their homes. Mm -hmm. You know, things like wainscoting or... Cotting, however you want to say it, both are correct. We've covered this. I will switch back and forth the entire time. Yeah, segment. Haley is not <laughs> consistent on how she pronounces that. I really just haven't decided which one I like better. No, I'm always confused yeah. what we're even talking about. Uh, crown molding, paneling, you know, creating thicker baseboards or trim. We've seen that a lot. And obviously adding wallpaper. We talk about that all the time. That's a huge way to add a lot of interest and character back into a space. But adding the wallpaper isn't really faking it with paint. No, but unless there you... is a fake for wallpaper. Okay. All right. So let's you, you covered a bunch of different things that people mm-hmm. are doing. Let's drill into them yeah. more specifically. Because all those things are talking about, you know, adding millwork, adding wood to the home, which is expensive. <laughs> so if I would do regular wainscoting, right. wainscoting, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. There's a lot of a wood involved. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly. literal stuff you're putting on the wall. Molding and attaching it and then we're caulking it and then, you know, 
potentially adding paneling as well. So there's a lot of money that's being invested into adding character into spaces, and not everyone has that money. Well, lots of us are cheap. Yes. (laughs) Right. So another segment where we can drill into the fact that I'm cheap or thrifty or whatever. So let's talk about a thrifty way. Right. To do that with paint. And I think you did this I did in it. your nursery. I did. Yeah. I think that wainscoting is a really easy way to add a lot of interest into a space. And it also allows you to play with color in a way that I don't know, maybe I wouldn't have done had I not thought of doing it as wainscoting. Because with the nursery, I decided to go with a really dark, dark green for, for that the main color. Right. Okay. And so. It feels a little mature for a baby's room. It also feels like kind of cave-like to do that dark green for the entire space. I was a mature baby. <laughs> maybe, you maybe. You are a mature baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to just sit silently because that was really good. So this is a dormer room. I would have had to take that green all the way up to the ceiling. It would have looked like a cave. But I wanted to keep that color as part of the scheme. So I decided, okay, what if I just kind of faked a wainscoting here and just took that green halfway up the wall, made a line all the way around. Figuratively. You didn't literally go halfway up the wall because there's a certain. Yes, there are certain dimensions that you should pay attention to because. We're not getting into that right now. Just Visually, just know that there are golden rules. Right. And (laughs) you you can find that information. But, you know, you just made a mark on the wall. You used a laser level or something. We're going to talk about that one of these days. And And painted this. Frog taped around the entire room, you know, according to that line. And then I just painted up to the frog tape and pulled it off. It was very satisfying because it was a perfect line, very crisp. And now I've got that dark green that just goes partway up the wall. I have it on the trim. And then, you know, the rest of the walls and the ceiling are kind of like an off white. But it gives that same visual impact as a traditional wainscoting, wainscoting wood. Well, it is funny because you showed me pictures and before we were talking about this. Yeah. And I assumed you had wainscoting on the walls. I didn't even think to question it. It's literally what it looked like. When you explained this later, I played it all back in my head and started asking questions. Is this just fake? And it is. Now, of course, in the room, it's going to be a little more because there's not molding there. So you just taped off that section. That's one way to go. Right. Now, people will also put literal. Like chair rail on top of that, a little strip that will finish it off and give you a little more visual. I've seen people will actually do that and then they'll create the little inset boxes. Yes. And And they'll do do that that really easily with just like the half round molding, which is actually pretty inexpensive. Right. So that's one way you can fake a really cool look, nice architectural features in a space. And the thing I like best about it, yes, it's cheap, all of those things. Yeah. What I really like is I've got a couple of rooms in the house where... Previously, you know, the the other owners have installed wainscoting Mm -hmm. and I want to remove it. And in one instance, it was glued. In all instances, it's glued. But it has been a mess to get off. With this, you're going to have a very simple process of switching to another look. Like if you ever decided that you don't want that, you know, piece of chair rail there, that's much easier to fix. I will say the one, you know, requirement is that you have smooth walls. If you don't and there's a lot of texture there, it's not going to have quite the same visual impact. You know, it's not going to trick you as well Mm -hmm. into thinking that this is truly, you know, what it is. Well, unless your eyesight's not the best, that might trick you out. Everything's a blur to me. So it'd be perfect for you. Perfect for me. It doesn't matter what my walls (laughs) look like. All right. So that's one way to fake it with paint. Yeah. How about another one? Uh, One that I really was interested in. You talked about how you've seen a lot of people taking more modern simple smaller trim right and you know baseboard and making it look like old school really big beefy baseboard yeah just with paint this is so smart and i would have never thought of it to be honest so i saw a video on instagram of course and this woman has probably a home that was built in like the 80s right so it's smaller you know maybe two and a half three inch baseboards around the room with that very simple profile that kind of tapers right to the wall and all she did she has smooth walls was paint that same trim color up a couple inches maybe two or three to create that five or six inch looking really substantial baseboard you know taped it Mm -hmm. off like I did with the wainscoting right just frog tape and then she went a step farther and added 
just a piece of half round to the top of it and painted that the same color too to really finish it off. But it, it's really convincing as these really substantial baseboards and it's just paint. Right. I Again, I really like that for the same reason. If you can't find the baseboard, you don't want to rip everything out right. to put new in. It's a really nice quick step, you know, and even so if you less expensive well, you. even if you can see the difference, it's still got a whimsical kind of a feel yeah. to it that I think could play in the right space. Right. That can be really fun on top of it, even that. if you can see the facts. That's true. So there are a couple of ways to fake it with paint. One more. Um, I mean, you could do a similar thing um, with paint at the top of the room, you know, by adding a faked crown molding <laughs> you know if you don't have it there you could technically drop the ceiling color if the rest of your trim is white just drop that white down over the walls a couple inches and it will give you kind of that visual impact of having that broken up space visually and I really do think it makes a difference yeah I like that there's just all kinds of different things you wallpaper can do. you know I said that really quickly but you could if you don't want to invest in wallpaper because it does have this incredible impact for a space it is expensive and if you don't have the money to drop on that right now you can probably afford a $20 quart of paint and some tape and make your own geometric pattern and still have a really great impact with that I like that a lot talk very briefly you've got maybe a minute we should talk about the the tape because yeah. we're, we're taping off a lot of things. You mentioned frog tape. Hopefully everybody out there is familiar with frog tape. If you're not, it's a special tape. It's chemically formulated yes. to react with water, basically, exactly. and seal the tape so you don't get this bleed through. You know, we all know what that feels like or looks like. Right. You tape off a room, paint up to the tape, remove the painter's tape, and you've got this bleed through. And the lines are not sharp. Yeah. With frog tape, if you do it right, yeah, you I can mean, get it, really sharp it's lines. It's really impressive. And I'm always... I don't know. Even after using it so many times, I'm always skeptical that maybe one of these times it's not going to be as good. And it's always impressed me. I have had the crispest lines I've ever had when painting using frog tape. And it comes in two different kinds, either the green or the yellow. The yellow the, and the in. blue now. There's oh, a, yeah, a true. Contractor. contractor. Right. So they've got three different options for you, but all of them remove really well. They have really crisp lines, and I always recommend when you're using frog tape to still, you know, go the extra mile. Use either a plastic putty knife to really make sure you're pressing down the tape really well, or with frog tape, something that you can do is just use like a damp paper towel and really press the tape down with that. So essentially, you're creating that seal with that chemical activation before the paint even hits it. All right. We'll put links in the show notes for all of those different products that we talked about faking it with paint. Yeah. There's way more things we could talk about. Way more things we could fake with paint. (laughs) Currency. We don't advocate that. We're not recommending that. I'm just stating the obvious. Uh, Yeah, so obvious. Yeah, it can be done. (laughs) Again, not a recommendation from Repcolite. But that's enough for now. I don't think I should say any more. I've said enough. We're going to take a break. When we come back, let's talk about the laser level. Yeah. You had great experience with that. I said we should talk about it. I decree that it is so. We will talk about it next, and we'll give away stuff. We've got winners from last week, and we're going to make new winners this week, all celebrating our 300th episode. That's coming up next. Stay tuned. And here we are yet again, Haley. Another segment, episode 300, the last segment of episode 300, the big extravaganza almost wrapped up wait till we hit episode 365 and you've got that is really a number that i am looking forward to yeah an episode a day for a year we'll give away some free paint for somebody who can prove that they've listened to a show a day for a year how on earth i'm not even going to remember when we get to that so it's just a bold claim that sounds good but i have no intention of backing up so thanks friends yeah (laughs) like to be honest at least at the end anyway We've got stuff to talk about. This is the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore, and we've got to earn our money. So, Haley, we're going to talk about laser levels, which has nothing to do with paint. I guess it can be well, used for helping you do things with yeah, paint. Yeah, this has really helped me a lot recently. Yeah, talk and about that. I, I think it's a tool that, honestly, everyone should have now. <laughs> I'm sold. I just love it. I've got a Bosch laser level, okay, which you know looks like a little box, and you put it on a tripod. Does it come with the tripod, or do you have to have your own? It doesn't come with a tripod, but some of them, if you pay extra, will come with a mount that you can like 
hang on the wall or the ceiling, but you could also just put it on a table, you know, okay. get creative. Okay. But like a, like a camera tripod will work? <laughs> yes, Is that what, exactly. what you're That's using? That's what I'm using. Okay. Yep. So All that'll right. work with it. And I just set it up in the middle of the room. It's got a 30 foot range that it'll allow me to, you know, kind of draw a line across the room. It has a vertical line and a horizontal line. So it's nice to have both of those so I can kind of square things really easily too. You can control where they go, where you put this horizontal mm-hmm. line or how does yes, that part exactly. Okay, So you're that just makes positioning sense. the laser level, you know, either if you've got the little um, stand for it where you're just adjusting it manually or if you've got the tripod, you've got the little swivel top that makes it really easy to kind of change where you're pointing it. Okay. Now, does it go around the whole room at the same time or is it just projecting onto the one wall? Both a little bit. Okay. (laughs) So I wouldn't say that it completes the 360 degrees because I kind of lose it Mm -hmm. after it turns that first corner about halfway down the wall. And that's partly due to the fact that I've got an entry-level version. I spent $60. You can spend $400 on these things if you no, want to. No, I can't. <laughs> I would be cheap, and I'll just borrow yours. Yeah. So, you know, you get what you pay for. If you really are serious, you're a professional, you know, you might invest more in these, and then they're going to go further. Okay. So you used it for the wainscoting. I used it for that, you know, faux wainscoting. That we just talked about. I didn't actually install any molding at all. All I did was just paint, you know, like 32 inches up the wall, and I used this to create that line. So I had a nice crisp line by creating the frog tape. Exactly. Okay. But it made it really easy, right? Because I'm just positioning this laser level in the middle of the room, pointing it at the height that I want it, and I'm just taping right along that line that it's created for me. See, if I'm 5'7", if I'm on my tiptoes probably, (laughs) so if I put it at about 5'2", I'd burn out my retinas, right? So I have to be <laughs> careful about that. Yeah, don't look directly at the laser. <laughs> like all lasers, we <laughs> and definitely recommend What's funny, that. too, is that they make glasses for these laser levels that kind of sometimes they're sold with them, but they're supposed to allow you to see the laser better. So, like, But not have, look into the laser. Right, okay. and that's where I think people could get confused. <laughs> Uh, because they're either red or green. I've got a red laser, so I would buy the red glasses, and they would allow me to see that line more clearly if it's in a really bright space. Okay, I need you to be very honest here. When you say you're thinking people could be confused, do you mean people or are you thinking me? Both. (laughs) Okay. Okay. At least I'm not alone. I don't think you're alone. Okay. Okay. All right. So you used it for that... You've got about a minute and a half before we've got to get on to giving stuff away, which yeah. people are chomping right. at the bit right. for. Excited but for. talk about other things we could do with this laser le- level, because it's not just wainscoting right. that you can fake. <laughs> yes. You could fake all kinds of things with the laser level, right? We talked about the crown molding or even, you know, making more substantial baseboards by faking it with paint. But I've also used this laser level to install wallpaper. It makes a really easy first line for me to work off of that I know is level because these lasers are self-leveling. I'm not manually leveling this laser. It's going to do that itself because it's on a little pendulum. You can kind of feel it inside. It Mm -hmm. just kind of always stays exactly on center. Even if I'm moving it sideways, it's still going to be exactly plumb. All right. Lots of uh, applications in that regard. I would think installing chair rails, tiling, you know, either the floor or the ceiling, Installing door jams is easier yep. when you've got a laser level to work off of. And I would think if you, you know, I mean, there's some of this is, you know, you'd have to know some stuff. But if somebody's going to break into your house <laughs> and you know how tall they are, you could set it up at night at right at that eye level. Right. That'd be effective. You could turn it into a game. You could make like a matrix situation for yourself, maybe, where you've got to like try to get through the room just you know, don't not touch the laser. Okay, just don't <laughs> look into the laser, children, right? Yeah. A lot of cool things. 60 bucks. 60 bucks. I, it makes things so much easier. I can't express the stress that it's taken off of these projects. No, I like that. We'll put a link in the show notes to the one that you bought yes. if you're interested, but there are a lot of other brands oh, yeah. out there. And yeah, a lot of different uses for them. And we're just scraping the surface there. Exactly. Because we've got big things to get onto. We've got to wrap up this 300th episode. But first, we have to give away the gift certificates from our contest last week. The right. people with neglected spaces who need to fix them. 
Three Haley, winners. you've got three winners for us. Mary Lambert, Sandra Kaminsky, and Joy Juries. All right. We'll be reaching out to you to get your information so we can get you the gift certificate for $100 worth of paint. Get those neglected spaces fixed. That's not a command. <laughs> That's just us being nice. We're offering. <laughs> sounded like a command, didn't it? Yeah. Get them fixed. Get them fixed, and I want to see pictures, and I'll let you know if you're good to go. All right. Last thing we want to do. It's our 300th episode. Yeah. You don't do this very often. In fact, we'll never do it again. 300 episodes. Yeah, that's true. Right? So this is it. So we want to celebrate by giving away three more gift certificates for $100 each. So three other winners, all you've got to do to get entered or to win, yes. you'll know right away today if you won, you just need to email me, radio at repcolite.com. I'll take the first one, the sixth one, and the eighth one. Right. Radio at repcolite.com. Email us. Go. You're entered. All right. That's all the time we've got. We're going to wrap it up. If you want to catch this one again, you can find it online at repcolite.com. Whatever you do today, make sure paint's a part of it. All of the Repcolite stores are open and waiting to help. I'm Dan Hansen. I'm Haley Johnson. Thanks for listening. Thank you.